Welcome everyone. As we're waiting for more people to come in, maybe you can just use the chat box and let us know uh, where you're joining from today. And yeah, since we're talking human design today, maybe you want to let us know your type and your profile. Um, hello, hello. Welcome, oh, okay. everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I would say hi a little bit. <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> okay. So today uh, we are welcoming you to our first human design deep talk. Um, yeah, just in time with the solar eclipse, <laughs> we somehow decided to start a new, um, yeah, format on our channel. And before I introduce our guest for today, I would just briefly, um, yeah, put a little disclaimer out there and yeah, just let us talk about uh, human design as an experiment today. Like always keep in mind that whatever you're hearing, especially now when we're talking um, about like specific people with specific types and profiles, these are all their um, personal experiences. And so you can reflect on whatever, um, for example, today Heather has experienced in her life and see how this resonates with you in your own life and take what resonates and don't take what doesn't. So I think that is the most important. Like human design should always be seen as something inclusive and it does. it, it shouldn't really feel exclusive. Like what I want to say with that is that sometimes we hear um, people or like for example generators saying oh I wish I was a manifester but that's not the idea behind human design it is really more of okay we are all unique whatever type you are you are important and you are part of of the whole we are all one so without any type or with without generators or without projectors, the world wouldn't functionate how it is functioning right now. So please don't have any hard feelings um, because maybe you're not a manifester or or like there is not like one super special type and all the others are unimportant. It is really we are all important and we are all unique. And this is what this, um, yeah, this deep talk is going to be about to just shine the light on a specific type and shine light on their um, not only shadow aspects but also on their light aspects and how can you deal um, with everything that is coming up in your life as a manifester, as a generator, um, as a reflector. So yeah, always consider to to treat human design simply like a guide that gives suggestions and you always have to consider that you still have your free will and nobody can take that from you. Um, so today we're going to start with with Heather as a manifester. Um, but throughout the um, like more sessions in the upcoming uh, months, we will interview different types and profiles and we will get more practical examples of how energies can play out in the real life. Um, so yeah, for, for the day to, yeah, get us started. Um, I just want to let you know that if you have any questions or experiences that you want to share with us, whether you are a manifester or a fifth line profile, or maybe you're married to one or your children are, uh, manifestors or fifth lines or whatever, um, you can do this after the interview today. We will have time for a Q&A session afterwards. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to that. And now I would like to introduce Heather to all of you. Um, as you know, uh, Heather is a 5-1 manifester. Uh, she is a Cancer Sun, Libra Moon and Scorpio Rising with her Conscious Sun in her Human Design chart in Gate 15. And her North Node is conjunct her Mars, for those of you who um, yeah, are a little bit into astrology. 
in the Gene Key 22. So, yeah, Heather is um, a wonderful woman that I met in, in Nicaragua a couple of years ago. And when I met her, like the first thing that I got to know is that she is a trauma healing mentor and she's working like with all possible tools. If it comes to psychology, if it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy, if it comes to EFT or to um, body codes, like there's so many things that she's integrating in her practice. Um, yeah, which I found really interesting. And yeah, now I would probably just give the word or hand the word over to her to, yeah, just let us know um, what you want us to know about you. And yeah, then we can get started. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for having me and for inviting me on the show. I didn't realize I was going to be like the first one you're interviewing. <laughs> so I feel a little special. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, like Cindy said, we met a few years ago, really on the topics of uh, human design and astrology, because that was at the beginning of my journey of understanding this information. And it was a really big moment for me and my healing journey. <clears throat> As I've grown and I've evolved, and have been able to overcome a lot of my own trauma. These tools have been like immensely impactful in understanding what is true for myself. So you have greater discernment of who you really are, right? What is authentic and how your energy works. Um, and then what is trauma? You can see that more clearly with the tools like knowing your natal chart and your human design. So um, Cindy was beautiful inside of my healing <laughs> journey and a lot of the information she gave to me. Um, Cause I had been presented with human design before. And so I was already inside of that. And I don't know if you know this, Cindy, but you know, from a couple of years ago that I was really struggling with that fifth line energy and some of the shadow aspects of it. And um, you helped me a lot navigate that. Now I'm here, right, where I've been able to integrate so much more of um, those themes and what they mean for me and how I'm able to navigate them in a really healthy way. So it's like my little like human design journey, but um, psychology and healing is nothing new to me. I have my bachelor's degree in psychology. I'm a multi-certified life coach, um, specializing in a lot of things, right? That fifth line jack of all trades, that five one jack of all trades energy is really strong in me. Um, so I've got numerous different certifications, whether it's body code, EFT tapping, somatics, um, Reiki, master level three, neuro-linguistic programming. There's a lot there, which also I think speaks to some of those moments when I was in the shadow self <laughs> of that first line of wanting to know more. How can I know more? How can I know more? So um, that's a little bit about me. I'm 35. I had to think about that. That's funny. <laughs> I'm 35. I have two kids, um, a four-year-old who is a 5'1 also. So I understand like how our 5-1 energy can interact with each other. Uh, my son's a 1-3, and then my husband is a 3-5 generator. So even that fifth line energy between us, which we'll talk about in terms of relationships, because I think that's really important for people who have the fifth line and they're one, they're navigating relationships. Um so yeah, um, I love, you know, just like a little bit about me. Like I'm, I love yoga and meditation. I love to color and to paint. I'm really creative and artistic and I homeschool my kids. Um, and I like to be the fun mom. So like my three areas of specialty are healing, manifestation and energy, and then motherhood. That's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> A little bit about me. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe then the two questions that we have prepared for you are uh, yeah, nicely fitting in here. So the first question would be, who are you to this world? And then who are you to yourself? I love this. So I thought about <laughs> it today because you prepared me. Um, the first one came easier for me. Like, who am I to the world? 
immediately, my immediate answer was a light. I've even before human design, I've talked about being a um, lighthouse or a flashlight in the dark tunnel of healing through trauma and wanting to help people who've gone through similar circumstances that I've been able to successfully navigate through and help them work through work through that, right? Which I think is very 5-1. We have an area of specialty. We have a very unique approach in whatever it is that our specialty is. And we're meant to find that beautiful segment of the population that is actually magnetized to us and share our practical solutions with them and help them in those areas. Um, who am I to myself? That was a little harder, but because it's it's harder to explain. Because in my fifth line journey, and especially having the fifth line paired with being a manifester, right? And we'll talk more about this, or maybe this is a good time to really dive into it. But there's so much in my aura that clouds who I truly am for most people, right? There is a lot in that. And you look at the projection field just in that, and nobody can be on the inside of that projection field. Even relationships that we've known for, I mean, I've known my husband for 20 years. We've been together for 17, 18, and there's still a projection. There are still times when there's moments or pieces of me that I don't think he truly understands. There's misunderstanding or there's a projection layer inside of that. And he also has some of those experiences too, because he's a three, five. And so who a fifth line actually needs to be to themselves, in my opinion, is our, our biggest cheerleader. We are the source of our love. I'm the, I am my biggest cheerleader. I'm the source of my love. I'm the source of my validation. I am, I am the rock that I need. I am the connection that I've always deeply desired, you know, in strengthening my relationship to myself and to source, to spirit. That's where I have found my manifestor peace. That's where I have found the intimacy or the vulnerability or the connection points that I've really craved my whole life. And I think a lot of fifth lines really crave it because even when we're unconscious and we don't understand the fifth line, we do understand that people don't know us, that like there is something there that is prohibiting this deeper layer of intimacy or of being understood and being seen for who we are. So for me, who am I to myself? I'm really just my connection to source and what I need. What And that could also be because I'm also a manifester, which manifester energy, we're not we're not loners, right? But we do have like this lone wolf energy to us as well, where we need a little bit less connection than some other types, if that makes sense. Yeah, what I'm hearing is like, you're talking a little bit about like this, I think they call it the repelling aura of the manifester. Um do you want to talk a little bit more how this has played out in in your life or how you would rather describe it maybe? Like, I think that's more like a raw expression, like the repelling aura. It sounds like very cruel. Um, maybe <laughs> we can we can make it more understandable and, and like graspable for people. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate raw, right? Like one of the things that I don't necessarily agree with is like in Gene Keys and quantum human design, they changed the fifth line name. And I think they tried to change the fifth line name to make it softer. The heretic comes with a lot of polarity, right? When you hear the word the heretic, it comes with this brazenness, I think. And it needs to. I feel like when we when we try to water that down a little bit, we call them the leader or something else, the innovator, that's highlighting our true capacity and our light. 
But I think sometimes it's a disservice or maybe an invalidation to the experiences we often have, especially as children, probably, where we're projected on by our parents or the relationships we've gone through and the rejections that we have felt. Um, And same thing with manifestors, right? Like manifestors, I feel like also have had a lot of experiences of rejection and I do think it's important for us to understand that so we can come to the understanding that it's not personal and that the rejection is actually our greatest protection. Because I remember when, like, when I first was reading a lot of this, like, man, this feels heavy. <laughs> like, I'm a heretic. I have a rejection field. No wonder mm-hmm. I have felt isolated and an alien my whole life. Like, no wonder I have just all of these circumstances where I was the problem. I was the scapegoat. You know, like, it was my fault when it really wasn't all these projections, right? When I've, and and there's a point in my life where I tried to overcompensate for that. She's like, from, I would say, like, 2012 to 2022, 2001, uh, 21, where not knowing that this was just my energy, but knowing that this was what people were experiencing with me, I tried to overcompensate for that. I tried to people please. I tried to smile more, to make myself more inviting, right? When my hair is funky colors, I am more inviting to people. And when somebody didn't really like me at first, I would go out of my way to talk to them and like show them like I'm approachable and, you know, I'm a nice person and all of these things. And I did gain that favor, right? They rejected me at first, but I was able to go and warm them up. And then we became friends And then I learned the very hard way that relationships that start that way are incorrect for my energy. And they will, those are the people that will do that 180 switch on the fifth line pretty quickly when the projection that they, or the expectation of you that they have had isn't what they now experience, right? So with the rejection field of the manifestor line and with the projection field of the fifth line aura, I feel like those are for our protection. And sometimes that's a little lonely because we are a special kind of spicy that I think is just here (laughs) for a certain part of the population. So oftentimes I see, especially, you know, not just in my own experiences, but in hearing other people that sometimes it's the relationships we were wanting the most, maybe a relationship with our parent or a sibling or a friend or a relationship, a significant other that ends up switching on us, that ends up hurting us a lot, right? We were really wanting this specific relationship to work out. And when it doesn't, we can internalize a lot of that into something is wrong with me. I'm not lovable. You know, what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. When in reality, what is happening is that those aren't your people. So navigating that aura and the projection field for me and my experiment has been letting it be what it bees. And no matter how much it hurts, if people are not magnetized, because the opposite for both the fifth line and the manifestor field is the magnetism, right? Now, fifth line, you have to be a little careful with that too, because that's still a projection and people will put you on a pedestal. And I'm like quick with my audience, (laughs) my clients and be like, please just remember that I teach these things, but not from a level of perfection, okay? I've embodied these and that I have been able to navigate them, but I'm still human, right? I still am going to make mistakes. I'm still going to occasionally, unfortunately, yell at my kids, right? When I'm teaching people how to um, be a more kind or conscious, respectful parent, right? Or I teach people about emotional regulation. There's still times when I'm dysregulated and I have a hard time regulating myself. 
So <clears throat> even the people that are magnetized to us, we still have to be a little cautious there. But when we can learn, I think, to embrace that magnetism and to show up there and to be okay with the rejection or the cancel culture or the projection, whatever else is coming, we re- that's when we can really stand empowered and show up and give the gift that we were meaning to, meaning to give to people. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how what would you say, what were like the tools that helped you the most um, to like work through this overcompensating, this like, um, yeah, just this kind of maybe living up to the expectations of others as well, like giving into those projections of others. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a lot, you know, just so people know, like in my experience, just recently this year, because this year I decided F it, I'm going all out. I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to step into my fullness. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. <laughs> and it was a lot of people's problems. <laughs> So my two best friends, one I had for eight years, the other one I had for 11 years, both of them were like, nope, we're out. And that hurt a lot, but it taught me about the projection field because both of those relationships were incorrect for me from the beginning. Both of those were women who were not magnetized to me, but I was magnetized to them in some kind of way. And so I went out of my way to try to form that relationship, to make that work, to people please in a lot of ways or water myself down. Um, and so as a fifth line too, I think we have to be careful of feeding into certain projections, which I have found myself doing out of abandonment and rejection wounds wanting that connection so badly, wanting to belong so badly that I was kind of morphing myself to kind of fit in, right? Whether that was subduing myself, trying to suppress some of my bigness or my energy uh, or people please in some kind of way. So it has really helped me, one, going through those experiences. And thankfully, like one of those women The relationship ended amicably. Like, you know, the one that just blew up. That was <laughs> more drama. Right? Um, that ended a little bit uh, abrasively. But my other one was very amicable. And we were able to come back before we decided this isn't going to work anymore and have a conversation about our different experiences inside of our friendship. And it was so enlightening to me that a person who I had known, I've known her since high school. So even before we became close friends, like I've known her for 20 years, we were close friends in college. We kind of went our own ways and then we came back together. And this time we were close friends for like 10, 11 years. I had been super vulnerable with her. Like she had seen some of the most vulnerable pieces of me. And did not know who I was, like her projection of me when she was talking to me about her view of me. And I'm just like, I've literally told her things that I don't think she heard because of the projection field. That was so crazy to me. And I've experienced this a little bit with my husband too, which thankfully Zach and I are at a point that we can have conversations about the projection field, about our projections of each other, which is just helpful for any relationship because we all have stories we tell ourselves about situations that we're involved in inside of our relationships with other people. Most of the times, those stories we're telling ourselves, well, he doesn't really care about me. Well, you know, she's just trying to do this X, Y, Z. Those are our own projections, our own wounds showing up. But I think it's even intensified with that fifth line projection field. Um, I kind of forgot where I was going with this, but oh, what, what tools helped me? <clears throat> One was really understanding that, was really seeing that, because I would have told you this woman knew, knew me. She didn't. 
So one of the things I think is just understanding, okay, this is this, it doesn't matter how open, honest, and vulnerable I am with someone. There's still going to be that projection there. And so understanding that pivoted the way I thought about my relationships and myself. And so I realized, okay, if I'm not going to be able to find this true depth and acceptance, validation, love, connection, intimacy outside of myself, then I need to anchor it within, which is also really good for that fifth line of needing to be rooted in something. And when you're a 5'1", getting rooted into that first line is really good and helpful for showing up. So my connection to that, which we call God, spirit, source, I use those names interchangeably. I'm extremely devotional to my practices. I wake up every morning. I hit the mat, whether that's yoga or meditation, usually a mixture of both. I've really strengthened that component of myself. So when I am struggling, when I do need a friend, when I am in my emotions, oftentimes I go there first before I go outside. And that has been really, really helpful because especially being emotional in my authority, my emotional states of how I emotionally react to things, it's not true for who I am or how I tend to view things. So I always need to take that pause but it's even more important when you're a five one, you definitely don't want to show up in your emotions in that fifth line because it's going to be interpreted probably not correctly. Right. So that first thing is definitely strengthening my connection to myself, my connection to spirit. And inside of that comes healing the rejection and abandonment wounds that I had. So a little bit about my history, you know, I grew up, I was born to two very young parents. My parents were 17 and 19 when they had me. Then they struggled through drug addictions. I mean, my entire, before the age of 10 was very chaotic, unstable, domestic violence, child abuse, neglect, staying the night at my like aunt's house because my dad was in jail and we didn't have a house, like all this kind of just lots of trauma. And then with my mother and my stepfather, that turned into a significant amount of emotional and mental abuse. So anybody who knows about the narcissistic family dynamic, my mom is a narcissist. Um, And I was a scapegoat child, right? Of course, (laughs) that was the fifth line of her three kids. And then I was also the one that was like, not could see, could see a lot of it for what it was and tried to stand up for it. So, so, and that usually that's the the one that is least likely to go along with the narcissistic behavior or the toxic family dynamics is usually the one pinned as a scapegoat. Um, And it affected me so much, all of this, that I tried to take my own life at 14. I almost did again at the age of 21, but thankfully was, able to choose uh, to put myself into therapy and start my healing journey. And over the last 15 years, it's really blossomed into where I'm at now. Um, So there's a lot of rejection and abandonment wounds that were really playing into a lot of my not self themes that were contributing to the people pleasing behavior of wanting to try to overcome this repelling aura I kind of have. Yeah. So doing a lot of that inner child healing work, the shadow work, uh, removing stored trapped emotions, learning emotional regulation, all of these healing tools, right? (laughs) Because it definitely hasn't been like one thing, which is why I specialized in it. Like every... Every time I find another tool that is helping me in my own journey, that what first line, I'm like, okay, I'm going to learn everything I can about this. And then usually I'll take a certification course. Um, So there's been a lot of different healing modalities, but it's healing those rejection wounds, which I think every fifth line is going to have. Mm 
to some degree because you've been through some kind of circumstance where you've experienced the polarizing aspect of your energy where you have been heavily projected upon and it usually involves you know just that rejection so um yeah, for fifth lines, for manifestors, for everybody, you know, healing your core wounds is extremely important. But especially for that fifth line or being a manifestor to show up in my bigness and to be okay, right? Every time I show up online as an authority, every time I step out a little bit bolder, I I get the trolls. Like the internet trolls are out there. <laughs> and you have to be okay with that. And that's okay. Right. You've got to be at a point where that's not hurting you to the point of wanting to close back in, wanting to shrink back down smaller. And for a lot of the earlier part of my life, I kind of played this back and forth game where I'd get a little bit of confidence and I'd step back out and then I'd hit that projection field or get that rejection. And instead of understanding, okay, you're just we'll just pivot over here. This is just not the space for me, or you're just not my person. I would take that personally and then close back in. So um, that's, that's a really big, important piece for everybody in their healing journey. But for that fifth line, that's gone probably through a lot of rejection, um, being okay in that rejection, realizing it's your protection is important. And I think you're the proper person to ask since you are in such a like long term relationship. How has your relationship? I mean, I suppose if you're so long together, it's like your best friend, basically. So as a fifth line, as a manifester, how can your partner or for the people out there who are listening, how important is to have somebody, friend, partner, whatever on your side who can like help you to go through some specific things? And what are the patterns that you're seeing that has that have helped you to go through all of that? Unfortunately, from what I've heard from a lot of feedback, I think my experience in having such a foundational relationship is unique. Um, for like a 5-1 manifestor, fifth line, or even just manifestors. I've, I've seen a lot of manifestor people inside of the Facebook groups I'm a part of really talking about struggling with long-term relationships. And I, I count my, my blessings. I, I feel like incredibly blessed. Um, but at the same time, like the only, there's only two people in my entire life that I've been close to that I've been intimate with that didn't reject that didn't at some point or time do the 180 on me right one is Zach that's my husband and the other one was my grandmother who was ironically also a 5-1 she was a 5-1 self-projected projector so I think she she saw that energy with me right we bonded kind of in some of that energy field um I think for fifth lines I've kind of seen that other fifth lines are make make better friends to some degree in terms of intimacy or connection points and i think it's if you especially now if you and you and your other fifth line friend know about human design and you can have conversations about the projection field right um because a key factor in what has helped mine and my husband's relationship remain so intact for so long is communication. I was informing before I knew I was informing, right? And he has thankfully, and maybe it's because we have other aspects in our chart. <laughs> you know, he has that gate 35. So he's down for the adventure of me. <laughs> because manifestors evolve, right? We are evolving people. We are constantly in an evolutionary state and our growth tends to be more rapid, I think, than a lot of other designs. That can be very scary to a lot of people because you're changing. And a lot. sometimes it's a lot of change. You know, Zach will say, like, you are not 
the person you were when we met, right? Or even when we married. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know what I was signing up for. And I was like, you got it. You, your soul knew. <laughs> um, so yeah, communication is really important, right? And finding somebody that can go through the changes with you. Um, because as a manifester, I think a lot of times our relationships are meant to be phases, right? We have this group of friends while we're in this one part of an aspect in our life. And when we go through another transition into another creative urge, sometimes a lot of those people don't come with us and that can be lonely. There is a really, I mean, I think raw talked about it too, like the loneliness factor of being a manifester. Um, and so communication for sure is really important. Um, and Zach and I have incredible communication skills, even before human design, obviously I have a degree in psychology. It's like what I've <laughs> done for the last 20 years. So like I'm educated and knowledgeable and have been able to be the facilitator inside of our relationship of being like, Hey, this isn't healthy communication, you know, pivoting and that sort of thing. But that's been the main thing that has helped us that an unconditional love. Zach really does have a beautiful, unconditional love aspect to him. Um, and, 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 and with his love also comes a lot of unconditional tolerance. Because I think unconditional love and unconditional tolerance are two things. I love my mother unconditionally. I do not tolerate her toxicity. Therefore, her and I don't have a relationship anymore. Right. And of course, nobody should have to suffer abuse under the terms of unconditional love. Like there's that's a, an extreme situation. Um, but, you know, a lot of people in my life that I was close to didn't have that same tolerance factor for things that are very innate to me. Right. Going back to some of these conversations with these friends that I've had and realizing that my jack of all trades energy. The fact that I change and evolve so often. Um, manifestors, they need more rest. We need downtime. We need to be, and that looks like solitude for me. Like, I don't want to talk to anybody, right? A lot of these very true and authentic pieces of me were being projected upon or being seen as a person who is flaky or I didn't know what I want because I changed, I changed too often. Um, so it takes a special type of person <laughs> to be able to provide us with a longer standing relationship. And I think that's important. And that's going to be somebody who's probably naturally magnetized to you. It's not going to be a relationship that you have to put in a lot of effort to try for. If it feels like the struggle of you always having to over explain yourself, of you always, you know, having to say, no, that's not right. If you're having to go out of your way in all of these different ways that are untrue for you, that relationship, even if it feels like it's filling a need for you now, or it feels like it's somewhat healthy now as a five one or as a fifth line, that's that person you kind of have to be like cautious with. Because you don't know what is going to be the trigger that switches somebody. And once they switch, they don't come back. I think Raw did a very good job of explaining that, of like, don't try. Just if they decided they don't like you, you just let it go. If they decided, and who cares how long that relationship has been, once somebody decides that they have an issue or that your energy is not correct for them, that's it. You know, it's, they don't come back from that. So yeah, finding the, the those people, right? Like in relationships, it's really important that our discernment is really high, that we are following our strategy and our authority, that we are listening to the energy in our body so that we can find the relationships that are correct for us. And I think as a fifth line manifester, you might find that that pool of people is a little bit smaller, especially not just the ones that maybe you're meant to help or the ones that you're meant to uh, work with, 
but the ones that you're going to take in closer, your best friends, you know, the ones that you're going to share secrets with, you have to have the most up and, and not to be guarded. It's it's a difference to be, than being guarded, right? You could be guarded. You could be blocked off. You could definitely come into the same energy from being wounded, being pissed off of like, well, you know, I don't care about anybody and I'm just going to have like these huge walls as boundaries and nobody gets on the inside. But that's a disservice to you too, because there are amazing people out there for you. There are beautiful relationships for you. They're just going to look differently sometimes than maybe what you want. In my experience, in my, in my experiment, I do really good in some of like these acquaintanceship friendships where, you know, work proximity relationships, people that I'm kind of involved in, in like an organization or a group where it's not like this best friend energy, but we have like this beautiful working dynamic or my clients I have beautiful relationships with my clients. And some of my clients have become friends, right? We've really done a, a lot there. I think what happens <clears throat> is we want to be more seen. We want to have more connection. All humans do. But the closer someone gets, like the one of the, the lines that just was like an aha moment from God <laughs> in relationships was that closeness breeds contempt. And I think that is one of the best advices for a fifth line to give us a the the heaviness or the weight the impact of the level of discernment we really need to have with our vulnerability and our closest relationships so we don't get hurt and like i said it's not to be guarded and not to let people in or not to let people see our beauty but those key fundamental relationships that have the the potential to be the most hurtful, whether that's a parent or like I said, a relationship, a significant other, a best friend. We have to be very mindful of who we allow in those spaces um, because everybody is going to come to you inside of that projection field and with their own projection of whatever it is. And the closer somebody gets, the more they know you, the more they see your habits, the more they see behind the scenes, then oftentimes that disrupts or is incongruent to the projection that they have of you. And that's where that hurt, that rejection, the abandonment starts to come from, right? Like, oh, like my one of my last friendships, like she met me. Or not she really, she met me like we became stronger friends again in this moment where I'd gotten super into law of attraction. I got really heavy into light and love and just being like this beautiful little soul. I'm, I'm going to be kind to everybody. I and mean, you should be kind to everybody. That's not what I'm saying. But I would just give and give and give to everybody. Like I was just giving all of everything to everyone. And I didn't care how they treated me. And so she had this vision of me of just being this beautiful, altruistic, the nicest person she ever met. That's what she said. You are the nicest person I've ever met. You just give so openly with a full heart. Well, it felt nice, but it left me. I mean, hurt relationship after hurt relationship after hurt relationship. Lots of people who came into my life at that time were on some type of narcissistic level. I was taken advantage of severely in multiple different situations. I made a couple people codependent on my energy in some of those situations, like so much incorrectness inside of that. But when she, we got closer, right. And I'm on my healing journey over the last few years of finding my empowerment, finding my voice, setting stronger boundaries to her. That was rude. She was like, all of this stuff you've been doing and setting boundaries and, and, you know, speaking up for yourself, it's just turned you into this very mean and rude person. And I was like, I'm literally just setting boundaries with nonviolent communication, <laughs> you know? So I think like inside of this, I like to rant a lot, but inside of this too, for a fifth line, 
I think it's so important that we are grounded in some type of like principle or our morals or our values in the way that we show up with others. So when people do come back like that, we can see what is true and where we need to take advice and what is just absolute projection and just total crap. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, you know? So if, if we can, because old me would have been so hurt by that, right? Like, my gosh, am I a terrible person for setting these boundaries and for, you know, asking for my needs and all of this stuff? I really would have taken that so much more into who I am and let that affect me and all of these things when now I know 90% of that was a projection. I'm sure there are some times when maybe I'm setting boundaries and my communication isn't great, or I said something that came off the wrong way or the tone in my voice, right? Like there's always room there for improvement. A well, fifth line has to understand that sometimes inside of the projections or the feedback we get from other people, there's going to be some things in there that we probably do need to hear or that we do need to take advice from, or we do need to take into consideration. It's not all just projection, you know? Um, but a lot of, a lot of it will be. So having that discernment for the feedback we get in our relationships is also equally important because I feel like a lot of people can easily fall into abusive situations in, um, taking on those projections as truth, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. What was coming to my mind while you were talking is like to check in a little bit more with like the shadow aspect, let's say, of the fifth line. I think that's also really interesting. What what I um, often see is either they go into like this um, state of victimhood, of like victimization and, oh, I'm I'm so poor, they're all expecting this and this from me, or they're projecting onto me. So what what can I do? But on the other side, there's also that type of fifth line um, shadow, let's say, um, where they are so much in their savior role, where I, I would sometimes say it's like the lack of self-worth is kind of pushing them into the role of, okay, I'm going to save all of these people out there and I have to live up to all of those expectations, what they want from me. And so it's really hard for them to, to navigate through these shadows. Do you have experience that by yourself or do you have any tips or clues how to, to deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I, I've experienced both because I think they both kind of go hand in hand through a person's journey at least in my experience, different parts of my life, I was showing up as different parts of that shadow, right? Which goes back to having the self-worth wounds, having the abandoned re rejection wounds, right? Um, and I see the same thing a lot, a lot of times happening with the feedback I've seen in groups, right? Where people, when people are asking these questions, um, I feel like when people first find out about human design, especially when they're newer into their experimentation and they're reading their charts and they find all of these pain points of it that they do find, they do get in kind of like this victimhood state. I did at first, I'll be honest, right? Like no, it, it explained a lot. And so it validated a lot for me, but at the same time of really understanding this fifth line and how it pairs with this, you know, manifest or aura and feeling like sad, like nobody is really going to ever know who I am. I will never be seen in my fullness for exactly a hundred percent, no matter how open I am. Right. Or just knowing that there's always going to be this possibility inside of my relationships that people do the 180 thing. And I can't really control that, which I had been for, I had been trying to <laughs> for so much of my life of trying to keep those people to happy, 
to stay and not, you know, which I think is why those two friendships lasted as long as they did. They're the only friendships I've ever had in my life that lasted that long. And it was because I went above and beyond, above and beyond in awful ways to try to keep them because I didn't want to be rejected again. Right. Um, and at the same time, when I was going through a lot of that law of attraction, positive, a toxic positivity moment in my life, I, the way I used to explain it was I took on people as projects. I would see somebody who was struggling in an area I had already healed in, and then I would want to go befriend them. And then I would want to help them. Most of those people didn't want my help. And a lot of them became then codependent on me because I would show up for them. I would be their listening ear. They could vent to me. I they I would listen to their struggles, all of these things, but they didn't actually want the help to get better. They just wanted to stay in that my, that that thing. So then that was really exhausting, right? Then I'm just giving energy and it's leaking everywhere. Um so I've kind of have like this experience with both of those. And again, it comes back down to these really core wounds of not feeling good enough, over trying, overcompensating our worth, right? Or trying not to be abandoned or rejected, rejected again. Um, or the loneliness factor, really seeking connection, really seeking intimacy. And it really is important that we go through our healing journey to stabilize, to ground ourselves, to then we can go and shine our light. Then we can really go and we can serve the people that we, because I think a fifth, I think five ones, we have like this innate energy of wanting to help. And then of course I have other aspects in my chart where I think that's even um, highlighted more, right? That altruistic part of me is very real, but I don't have the energy to save the whole world. <laughs> I have to tell myself that, right? I can't do that. Um, so again, it kind of comes back to also having discernment of what relationships are correct for us and what relationships aren't correct for us. Um, yeah, it's a lot that goes in there, you know, to pull ourselves out of that victimization of always feeling projected on and growing a thicker skin to be able to take the rejection points, especially if you're going to show up online. If you're going to show up online, it's a world stage. You're going to, you're every time I, again, every time I step out big, poof, there they are. And it's, it's taken time for me to like heal through that. So I don't get dysregulated by it. Right. I don't get triggered by it. Um, but I do, I do see those common themes. And I do think too, like we've, we talked about that fifth line can go a little bit narcissistic a little bit. Like we can then go into this, well, everything's a projection and I'm just going to be who I am and F everybody else and not take anything into account, uh, like um, not accountability, but consideration. Yeah. Right. Inside of the, in, even inside of the feedback I've gotten, there have been, there's valuable feedback of places that I can improve on areas that I need to work on. Um, and having that discernment to know what, I, what is real for me and what is a projection is really important. And I just think that takes time and experimentation to in your own self, right? Because then all of this kind of stuff has a lot of nuance to it with other aspects or components of your chart. Like I think my heavy, um, the heaviness I feel of some of that rejection or projector field is exacerbated or is more because I'm also a Scorpio rising, which comes with the mysteriousness too. <laughs> it comes with, you, you can't figure me out, right? And so, or the line, I have the channel of judgment, which I think sometimes I have to be very careful with. I'm not here to say everything that I notice. <laughs> so, you know, another thing inside of this topic, I've, I've found a lot of frustration with fifth line manifestors, this is with in my fifth five one manifestor group, 
with people who want to help people, who know how to help these people that don't want help from them. And a lot of frustration or anger inside of that of like, I like I know the answer. I know what you're needing help with. And every time they try to help, it's not taken great, right? Or the person completely rejects it. And that's very true for intimate relationships, right? And I don't, I think this is more of a fifth line thing where we have to be very uh, careful, mindful in our closest relationships that we don't always show up to be the helper like Zach, right? My husband has been going through this huge, beautiful healing journey, self-discovery process for about the last four years. Um, I'm an expert <laughs> in that field. <laughs> Hello, choose me. I have all, I, I have your answers. Does not want any of them. Does not want any of my help does not want any of my insight, does not want any of my input. Oh my gosh, it's, it's painful. And a lot of times, a few years ago, it would drive me crazy, right? He would be struggling in an area I was educated in, I could help give the tools for, and he didn't want it. So, and I've seen that in a lot of my closer relationships that they're not coming to us to be helped. And we have to be okay with that, that there will be people in our life, especially the people who are closest to us that don't want that side of us. And that's, that's gotta be okay. We have to be okay with that. They are filling, we're filling each other's cups in different ways. And I think what I've noticed with my husband is even though there's not this direct learning partnership, right? Where he's coming to me with a problem and I'm providing the solution, right? I'm still providing the solutions, whether it be in my energy, whether it be in my modeled behavior, whether it be in all of these other ways that is still beneficial to that person. It's just not like this direct thing. And so I think that's another thing inside of our relationships. Um, one, one other thing too, I wanted to talk about that you mentioned was the pressure. There's a lot of pressure with a fifth line, I think. And what I realized though, <clears throat> there's two pressure points. And one of the one we focus on more is the pressure we feel from other people, the projections of others, the pressure that they place on us and how that impacts us and all of that. But in being able to have these beautiful conversations with my husband about projections, about all of these things, I have realized, and probably a lot of this was learned behavior, it has come from somewhere, but the majority of a lot of the pressure I was putting on myself in our household, me as a mom, my, how much work I'm contributing to the home, how much income I'm contributing to the home, all of these different ways, right? Where I was thought I was feeling pressure by my husband. And when we could talk about it, I was like, oh, that's internalized pressure. So there's like, I think, um, what I think it's in, is it in the... It is in the, the channel of judgment that can come with a lot of the perfectionism um, and the internalized pressures I was putting on myself. So we also, I think, have to be mindful of, is this pressure I'm feeling from somebody else or is this pressure I am putting on myself? And when I really started to notice that and I could see that and I can ask myself, is this something I'm feeling like I should do? Is this something I'm feeling like I am pressured to do? Or is this something like I genuinely am desiring, I'm wanting and only acting out of desire or want and not out of the should or the pressure has really let me let go and find a lot more peace, a lot more peace. And then also, my impact is so much better, right? Even if this is in my business and I'm creating a course or I'm creating something, if I create it out of pressure, 
it doesn't end up very well, right? Whether that's pressure to make a certain income, pressure to show up a certain way, pressure to provide something for a client or my audience versus when I show up because this is fun, because this is what I want to teach, because this is what I'm feeling called to do, right? Coming right back down to our strategy and authority. It's, it's, it's so important, I think, for us to try to live more in harmony and to recognize all of the pressures that either are coming from ourselves or from others and to just let them go, just like, which is hard, but it takes a lot of nervous system regulation, self-awareness, subconscious repatterning helps a lot, removing a lot of the trauma. All of those things really can help you let go in a very healthy way, um, especially mentally, internally, and uh, show up and be more authentic. Yeah, that was really important that you yeah talked about the pressure again. I think that's like that's a good point to to stop at. I would say. I mean, we're already running like one hour. That's crazy how fast <laughs> time is passing by. So I think we indeed have a lot of questions. Um, so before we actually go into the Q&A, um, I would say uh, we're just quickly um, yeah, talking about um, where people can find us because the Q&A will only be for like exclusively for those who are here on live now. Um, so yeah, if any one of you who's listening right now um, wants to get a reading and wants to just get a better understanding of their human design chart or maybe astrology and gene keys as well, then we are offering our readings on our hyphen soul page. We're going to put the link below. And then Heather as well, of course, if you're interested in what she's doing, what she's offering, um, then she's going to explain you where you can find her actually. Yeah. So if you, you guys can find me on Instagram at the heart centered woman, um, or on TikTok at the heart centered woman. Um, I have a lot of free content. You know, I have a free Facebook group that I also show up in. All of my content is around healing, <clears throat> right? Healing, energetics, manifestation, and motherhood. And so, um, I take, you know, one-on-one -on -one clients I have a, mem a membership program, where I dive deeper into setting boundaries. And um, we've got uh, other courses in there on, there's so much in there now, uh, emotional regulation tools, nervous system health, all of those kinds of things, EFT tapping, um, meditation. And then I have a second tier to my mentorship program with weekly coaching calls where I'm teaching people the healing modalities. Right now we're going into body code. We've already gone into Reiki and understanding our energy bodies. And so that's a little bit about like what I do in my business, right? I am the trauma healing mentor. I just show up to really help people who are struggling in their healing journeys, specifically you know, with self-love, self-worth, acceptance, validation, healing those inner child wounds. So if you guys are interested in that, uh, you can find that all social media platforms at the Heart Centered Woman and then the heartcenteredwoman.com. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I think especially also for those who are members in our community and membership, I think Heather's work is just perfectly adding to like the human design, Gene Keys astrology background. And yeah, also for those who signed up before, uh, you will get your um, your free module of our human design course. And so you can look forward to that. And with that being said, I think we would go into the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. 